Hi, my name is Brad Nail with the University of Indianapolis. This video is going to be talking about the yields of chemical reactions as well as the concept of limiting reactants. So before you watch this, do make sure that you watch the OpenStack, uh, or I'm sorry, you read the OpenStack textbook section on this. I believe it's 4.4 in the Chemistry 2E text that's available freely online. Okay. So when we're talking about yields and limiting reactants, we have to first pause for a moment and we have to realize that there's a number of different things that can happen with a reaction. Um, one, not every reaction goes to plan. There's a lot of times that um, for reasons outside your control as a chemist that you're not going to produce the quantity of product that you thought that you were going to. So in the previous video, um, when we talked about how to figure out how much reactant you needed in order to create a certain amount of product, so if you haven't watched that previous video, you might want to, we presupposed that that reaction was gonna go at 100% effectiveness. That thing was going to, like if we started with the set amount of our reactant, we were definitively gonna get out a certain amount of the product. Now that stuff, that what we just described there and what we talked about in that video is all theoretical. Theoretical, and that's not how you spell that, but whatever. Theoretical is where we spend a lot of our time as chemists uh, when we're planning, but then since we spend most of our time actually in the lab, um, we don't, <laughs> the lab is not the same place as theory, nine times out of 10. Um, even some of the best reactions we have do not work to that 100% effectiveness. And so what we have is what we create in the lab is actually called our actual yield. So we have our theoretical yield, and that comes from calculations. And we're saying, yeah, we're totally presupposing that everything works 100% like it's supposed to 100% of the time. The actual yield is what happens in the lab. Now, the actual yield cannot be over 100%. You can't think, like if you think about an example with like hot dogs and hot dog buns, you can't start with eight hot dogs and eight hot dog buns and end up with 10 hot dogs to serve to people. It doesn't work. That does, and it also doesn't work like that in chemistry. So if you ever get an actual yield that is above your theoretical yield, it's a good indication that your stuff isn't pure. Uh, you didn't make what you were thinking you were going to make. Um, your stuff's not dry. That's another way. I, that's a more specific way of saying it's not pure. Excuse me. Um, there's something that's gone wrong. Your actual yield at best is going to equal your theoretical yield. Most of the time, your actual yield is going to be less than your theoretical yield. And this is where percent yield is going to come into play. Let's write that down a little bit lower here. Percent yield. Percent yield. So your percent yield is going to be your actual yield, the thing that you measure in the lab, over your theoretical, again, didn't spell that right, times 100. So it's just the ratio of the two. And for some reactions, your percent yield might be really ridiculously small, like 8%. That doesn't mean that that reaction was a failure. That just might mean that that reaction's really hard to do, and there's all these other kinds of things that you can't control and you can't mitigate. Um, and so your yield's just always gonna be crummy. That happens. That absolutely happens all the time. Maybe side reactions take place. Um, maybe in order for your reaction to actually go uh, forward to products, you're having to add in a bunch of heat. But while you're simultaneously heating it, 
um, to make the products form, you could be slowly degrading your reactants. So you're actually lessening the amount of reactant that's actually available for the reaction to take place. There's just all different kinds of things. As long as you have uh, some data to back up what you've made is right, you've shown it to be replicable, um, your percent yield is what your percent yield is. You do always need to be careful, though, of that more than 100% yield. That one's always going to be a red flag that something went wrong or you didn't make what you thought you made. So let's do uh, an example while simultaneously discussing the idea of limiting reactant. So in order to do this, we need to have a chemical equation. So for this chemical equation, um, I'm going to show you uh, the reaction of aluminum solid plus hydrochloric acid going to generate or liberate hydrogen gas and aluminum chloride. So this is a reaction that uh, where we're at in general chemistry right now, I wouldn't expect you to be able to say, if I mixed aluminum and on all this in the chemical names, not writing out any of the chemical formulas here, right? We're past the point in time uh, where you should rely on chemical formulas be given to you. You should be able to do the names and then convert those to the formulas. But if, like, I would not expect you though to say, Oh, aluminum solid plus hydrochloric acid release, you know, means hydrogen and aluminum chloride. Now, in reality, when you mix a strong acid with a metal, you're almost always going to release hydrogen gas. And then whatever the metal is, is going to form uh, some kind of salt with the anion that was from the original acid. So this is a pretty standard kind of reaction to be able to know probably not going to hold you to that standard though. What I would definitely hold you to the standard of is if I tell you what every one of these are and as their chemical names, you'd be able to write out the equation like we've got here and then go ahead and write out what the balancing is. So if you do the quick, fast, dirty balancing, you can, there's a bunch of different ways that we could uh, slice and dice this. If you started with your aluminum, you'd say, okay, there's one aluminum here, there's one aluminum here, aluminum's good. Since this isn't really a double displacement reaction, doing the whole ping-pongy thing isn't really that particularly useful. We may as well try it, though. We've got three chlorides, one chloride. If we put a three here, we are now have our chlorides happy. Uh, we have three hydrogens on our reactant side. We only have two here. The only way to make these really jive um, is to either say three halves hydrogen gas. So we could do like a three halves here. Um, I'm of the personal opinion that I don't like that. I only like using whole numbers for my stoichiometric coefficients. So to get the three and the two to play nicely, I need to figure out what the lowest common denominator is. For them, it's gonna be six. So if I put a three here, and then I come back and I erase that three that was over in front of the hydrochloric acid and I put a six. Well, now the hydrogen's good. That also, though, means that I need to go back and rebalance the aluminum chloride. And it also means I need to go back and rebalance the aluminum. But after I do that, hey, it's kind of nice. Everything is balanced in a very nice, succinct way. And I'm have, not having to deal with fractions. Easy breezy, lemon squeezy. All right, in order for you to do a limiting reactant problem, um, you're going to need a certain amount of information. Specifically, you're gonna need to know either, you're, well, specifically, what you're gonna have to either be given or you're gonna have to find are the moles of your reactant here. So moles and moles here and your book teaches you how to do this one way. I'm going to teach you this other way because it works out better. Trust me. But you're going to have to know the moles or figure out the moles of each of these. 
In that previous video, we talked about you can go from grams to moles with our molar mass to figure out the moles. You can use your molarity and volume of a solution to figure out moles, or you could be given the number of particles and you can figure out moles. Doesn't really matter. Just you pick the right path of those to go down based off the starting material or the starting information that's given to you. For the sake of this problem, um, and to try to make things quasi easy, let's say that we've got 3.41 moles of our aluminum that's given to us. And let's say we've got something like, I don't know, um, 10.52 moles of hydrochloric acid. So I've said it once, I've said it a million times, you don't measure moles in the lab. I'm assuming at this point in time, though, that because we've talked about this in previous videos, um, you can get to this step in a variety of different ways. If you still don't feel comfortable getting two moles, please make sure you hop in those office hours um, so we can start working on that because we've got to make sure that you can get the moles. So I, for this problem, I am going to tell you that we are starting with this right here. The question is, the question is going to be, what is our limiting reactant, which a lot of times you're just going to say LR. What is our theoretical yield? What is our theoretical yield? Okay. This is our jump off point. Like we talked about in the last video, we could write ourselves a little plan here. But what we have to acknowledge before we write ourselves a plan is we've got two possible scenarios. There's two possibilities. Right now, either scenario one, nope, need to see, scenario one is that our aluminum is going to be our limiting reactant. Limiting reactant is the thing that runs out first. The second scenario is our hydrochloric acid is going to be our limiting reactant. So there's two possibilities here, and we're going to test both of these possibilities as hi hypothetical. So that is to say we're going to go if our aluminum is our limiting reactant, then the following will be true. I don't remember what the code is for true. That's like logic something something. There's like a little symbol you can use. Not the one of those clothes. So what we're about to write is a hypothetical. If our limiting if aluminum is our limiting reactant, the work that we're about to do will be correct. So that means we start with our moles of aluminum. And just like in the previous video, we can convert our moles of aluminum into how much product we would be generating and via the stoichiometric coefficients. Now, hopefully you're screaming right now, but what about our products? Which product do we choose? It's a really good question. Typically the product that you're gonna wanna choose is the one that is either forming uh, the insoluble solid or the thing that is coming out of solution. So I guess that's the generic way of saying it. Measure the one that is coming out of solution. If you go to your solubility rules, you're gonna see your aluminum chloride is gonna be soluble. So going into the lab and measuring how much of a soluble thing you've generated is really hard. 
because that means you have to somehow make sure that you've isolated the thing that was soluble. You have to get rid of all of the water so you have just like a solid dry material there. Um, and that makes it sound like it's pretty straightforward. It usually isn't. Um, so measuring the soluble thing is usually super hard and not the right call. Measuring the thing that comes out of a solution is usually infinitely easier to do. In this particular problem, we're forming hydrogen gas. So this gas, because it's a gas, is gonna come out of the solution. And if we have a pressure sensor or all different kinds of matter of things, heck, even if we have a balloon, we can catch the hydrogen gas that comes off of this. So the right call then is to figure out what our theoretical yield, it's gonna be the theoretical yield of the thing coming out of solution in this regard, in this problem, it's gonna be the hydrogen gas. So we go down to our, our where we started our work and we're gonna say, using our stoichiometry for every, oops, not three, for every two moles of aluminum, we generate three moles of hydrogen gas. So right now you're saying, cool, we've got this in moles, solid. And some people will say, uh, for the method I'm gonna show you on how to figure out your limiting reactant, they'll be like, great, you can stop here. I say no to that. The reason I say no to that is your theoretical yields are going to nine times out of 10 be uh, written out in terms of grams. So we may as well figure out in this scenario that we're working right here, we may as well figure out how many grams of hydrogen we're gonna form. So it'd be just one additional step, which really isn't that bad. Again, using our molar mass, see previous video, for example. And when we do this, we cancel out stuff. Moles of aluminum cancel, moles of hydrogen cancel. We throw this into our calculator and we get a number. And naturally, don't have my calculator on. So gotta find my calculator, which means turning on the light. So Hello, calculator, you can do it. All right, so we got our 3.41 times three times two divided by two, and we get 10.23 grams of hydrogen that are formed. But this is only true if aluminum is our limiting reactant. That's only true if aluminum is our limiting reactant. We have scenario two to still run. So scenario two is if hydrochloric acid is our limiting reactant, then the following underneath of this will be true. Only scenario, only scenario one or two will be true. They can't both simultaneously be true. It's gonna be one or the other, okay? We're gonna set up the problem pretty much the exact same way. So we start with that 10.52 moles of HCl. Using our stoichiometry, we're gonna say for every six moles HCl that are consumed, we're gonna generate three moles of hydrogen gas. Just like the previous scenario, we're gonna convert this over to grams too, as well. Now, one thing that you might be asking yourself is, why in the world did we convert both of these to hydrogen? Why didn't we convert one of these scenarios to the aluminum chloride? And that's a good question. The answer is you wanna compare apples to apples. If we set up scenario one and we were looking at 
hydrogen, the only way to compare scenario two is to also convert it to hydrogen. If we converted to the aluminum chloride, we'd be convert, we, we would be comparing the amount of hydrogen that could be produced compared to the amount of aluminum chloride that could be produced. And you can't compare grams to grams. And you definitely shouldn't compare grams of one product to grams of the other product. That's like a double no-no. You want to keep as many variables the same as possible anytime you're doing science. If you're doing science right, you're probably only changing one variable so that you really can figure out the thing that you're testing and what its impact is. By changing the product that we would be aiming at, we would be changing two variables. We'd be changing what the products are and we'd be changing what would be our limiting reactant. By only changing the limiting reactant and having both of these scenarios solve for the hydrogen gas, we only changed one thing. So we throw this in our calculator. So the 10 point, let's actually throw this in our calculator, 10.52 times three times two divided by six equals, and we get, are you kidding me? 10.52 grams of hydrogen. All right, moment of truth time, moment of truth time. And that moment of truth is, which one is it? Is this one or this one right? We have to define what right means. Okay, let's go back to what we were talking about in those scenarios. So in the scenario, we're presupposing one of these things is gonna run out first, right? If you think about an example with hot dogs and hot dog buns again, if you got seven hot dogs and you get eight hot dog buns, cause you know, you gave one of the hot dogs to your dog cause you know, your dog was like, you know, crying or whatever, or you dropped one when you were like cooking it or you know, throw it away. All the, you have seven hot dogs and you have eight hot dog buns even though you got eight buns, you can only make seven hot dogs. You, one of those things ran out first and it limits the amount of product that you can make in total. That exact same reasoning is what we're gonna use here. If I can get this to work, come on buddy, you can do it. That exact same reasoning is what we're gonna use up here. We're gonna ask ourselves, which of our scenarios produced the least amount of hydrogen gas? Whichever scenario produced the least amount of hydrogen gas is the scenario that's actually correct. The other one is incorrect. So we look up here and we say, all right, 10.23 grams of hydrogen, 10.52 grams of hydrogen, in most countries, 10.23 grams is less than 10.52 grams. The 10.23 grams up here, scenario one, this is gonna be our winner, winner, chicken dinner. This is the scenario that is actually gonna happen. So that means here that this if statement about the hydrochloric acid being the limiting reactant is incorrect. So, aluminum is our limiting reactant. And wasn't that one of the questions that we said? Yeah, the question is, what is our limiting reactant? You just figured it out. It's the aluminum. It's the aluminum because that scenario produced the least amount of hydrogen gas. The next question was, what's the theoretical yield? Well, hey, by solving the problem the way that we just did, the 10.23 grams is your theoretical yield. So by writing out this problem in this manner, testing these two scenarios like this, we are killing two birds with one stone. So we figured out our limiting reactant and we figured out our theoretical yield. So is that 10.23, I'm gonna rewrite that down here. 10.23 grams is our theoretical. 
what if we go in the lab and we only generate 6.45 grams? Now, the only way to know what your actual yield is is for a problem to tell you it or to go in the lab and do it, do the experiment. That's it. So your problem is going to have to tell you or it's going to have to, or you're going to have to go in the lab and do it yourself. You're probably not going to have time to go into the lab and do it yourself during an exam. If we were going to calculate out the percent yield then, we take our 6.45 grams over the 10.23 grams times 100, throw that into our calculator, and we're going to get ourselves a nice respectable 6.45 divided by 10.23, and we're going to get ourselves a nice respectable 63% yield. For everybody who's been playing along at home with respect to sig figs, Absolutely, I was fast and loose with sake fix because I was just giving you guys approximate examples. This problem, the way that this 6.45 is, this should really make this 63, 63.0 because that was the next number that was on the calculator. So 63% is our yield if we were actually able to only produce 6.45 grams. That, folks, is our lecture on yields, the theoretical yield, the actual yield, as well as determining limiting reactants. Please let me know if you have any questions, and thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.